21 lessons for the 21st century by yuval noah harari chapter 21 meditation just observe having criticized so many stories religions and ideologies it is only fair that i put myself in the firing line too and explain how somebody so skeptical can still manage to wake up cheerful in the morning i hesitate to do so partially for fear of self indulgence and partially because i don't want to give the wrong impression as if what works for me will work for everybody i am very aware that the quirks of my genes neurons personal history and dharma are not shared by everyone because it is perhaps good the reader should at least know which host color the glasses through which see the world thereby distorting my vision and my writing when i was a teenager i was a troubled and restless person the world made me no sense and i got no answers to the big questions that i had about life in particular didn't understand why there was so much suffering in the world and in my own life and what could be done about it all i got from the people around me and from the books i read were elaborate fictions religion myths about gods and heavens nationalist myths about the motherland and its historical mission romantic myths about love and adventure or capitalist myth about economic growth and how buying and consuming stuff will make me happy i had enough sense to realize that these were probably all fictions but i had no idea how to find truth when i began studying at university i thought it would be the ideal place to find answers but i was disappointed the academic world provided me with powerful tools to deconstruct all the myths humans ever create but it didn't offer satisfying answers to the big questions of life on the contrary it encouraged me to focus on narrower and narrower questions I eventually found myself writing a doctorate at the University of Oxford about autobiographical texts of medieval soldiers. As a side hobby, I kept reading a lot of philosophy books and having lot of philosophical debates. But though this provided endless intellectual entertainment, it hardly provided real insight. It was extremely frustrating. Eventually, my good friend Ron Meron suggested that I try putting aside all the books and intellectual discussions for a few days and take a vipassana meditation course. I thought it was some new age mumbo jumbo and since I had no interest in hearing yet another mythology, I declined to go. But after a year of patient nudging In April 2000 he got me to go to a 10 day vipassana retreat Previously I knew very little about meditation and presumed it much involved all kinds of complicated mystical theories I was therefore amazed by how practical the teaching turned out to be The teacher at the course as and goenka instructed the students to sit with crossed legs and closed eyes and to focus all the attention on the breath coming in and out of the nostrils don't do anything he kept saying don't try to control the breath or to breathe in any particular way just observe the reality of the present moment whatever it may be when the breath comes in you are just aware now the breath is coming in when the breath goes out you are just aware now the breath is going out and when you lose your focus and your mind starts wandering in memories and fantasies you are just aware now my mind has wandered away from the breath it was most important thing anybody ever told me when people ask the big questions of life they usually have absolutely no interest in knowing when the breath is coming into the nostrils and when it is going out rather they want to know things like what happens after you die yet the real enigma of life is not what happens after you die but what happens before you die 
if you want to understand death you need to understand life people ask when i die will i just vanish completely will i go to heaven will i reborn in a new body these questions are based on the assumptions that there is an i that endures from birth to death and the question is what will happen to this i after death but what is the that endures from birth to death the body keeps changing every moment the brain keeps changing every moment the mind keeps changing every moment the closer you observe yourself the more obvious it becomes that nothing endures even from one moment to the next so what holds together an entire life if you don't know the answer to that you don't understand life and you certainly have no chance of understanding death if and when you ever discover what holds life together the answer to the big question of death will also become apparent people say the soul endures from birth to death and thereby holds life together but that is just a story have you ever observed a soul you can explore this at any moment not just the moment of death if you can understand what happens to you as one moment ends and another moment begins you will also understand what happens to you at the moment of death if you can really observe yourself for the duration of a single breath you will understand it all the first thing i learned by observing my breath was that notwithstanding all the books i had read and all the classes i had attended at university i knew almost nothing about my mind and i had very little control over it despite my best efforts i couldn't observe the reality of my breath coming in and out of my nostrils for more than 10 seconds before the mind wandered away for years i lived under the impression that i was the master of my life and the ceo of my own personal brand but a few hours of meditation were enough to show me that i hardly had any control of myself i was not ceo i was barely the gatekeeper i was asked to stand at the gateway of my body the nostrils and just observe whatever comes in or goes out yet after a few months i lost my focus and abandoned my post it was an eye opening experience as the course progressed students were taught to observe not just their breath but sensations throughout their body not special sensations of bliss and ecstasy but rather the most mundane and ordinary sensation heat pressure pain and so on the technique of vipassana is based on the insight that the flow of mind is closely interlinked with body sensations but when me and the world there are always body sensations i never react to events in the outside world i always react to the sensations in my own body when the sensation is unpleasant i react with aversion when the sensation is pleasant i react with craving for more even when we think we react to what another person has done to president trump's latest tweet or to a distant childhood memory the truth is we always react to our immediate bodily sensation if we are outraged that somebody insulted our nation or our god what makes the insult unbearable is the burning sensation in the pit of our stomach and the band of pain that grips our heart our nation feels nothing but our body really hurts You want to know what anger is? Well, just observe the sensation that arise and pass in your body while you are angry. I was 24 years old when I went to this retreat and had experienced anger probably 10,000 times previously. Yet, I had never bothered to observe how anger actually feels. Whenever I had been angry, I focused on the object of my anger. something somebody did or said rather than on the sensory reality of the anger 
I think I learned more about myself and about human in general by observing my sensation for these 10 days that I learned in my whole life up to that point. And to do so, I didn't have to accept any story, theory or mythology. I just had to observe reality as it is. The most important thing I realized was that the deepest source of my suffering is in the patterns of my own mind. When I want something and it didn't happen, my mind reacts by generating suffering. Suffering is not an objective condition in the outside world. It is a mental reaction generated by my own mind. Learning this is the first step towards chasing to generate more suffering. Since that first course in 2000, I began meditating for 2 hours every day. And each year, I take a long meditation retreat of a month or two. It is not an escape from reality. It is getting in touch with reality. At least for 2 hours a day, I actually observe reality as it is. While for the other 22 hours, I get overwhelmed by emails and tweets and cute puppy videos. Without the focus and clarity provided by this practice, I could not have written sapiens or homo deus. At least for me, meditation never came into conflict with scientific research. Rather, it has been another valuable tool in the scientific toolkit, especially when trying to understand the human mind. Digging from both ends Science finds it hard to decipher the mysteries of the mind, largely because we lack efficient tools. Many people, including many scientists, tend to confuse the mind with the brain, but they are really very different things. The brain is a material network of neurons, synapses, and biochemicals. The mind is a flow of subjective experiences such as pain, pleasure, anger, and love. Biologists assume that the brain somehow produces the mind and that biochemical reactions in billions of neurons somehow produce experiences such as pain and love. However, so far, we have absolutely no explanation for how the mind emerges from the brain. How come when billions of neurons are firing electrical signals in a particular direction, I feel pain? And when the neurons fire in a different pattern, a feel love. We haven't got a clue. Hence, even if the mind indeed emerges from the brain, at least for now, studying the mind is a different undertaking than studying the brain. Brain research is progressing in leaps and bounds thanks to the help of microscopes, brain sensors and powerful computers. But we cannot see the mind through a microscope or a brain scanner. These devices enable us to detect biochemical and electrical activities in the brain, but do not give us any access to the subjective experiences associated with these activities. As of 2018, the only mind I can access directly is my own. If I want to know what other sentient beings are experiencing, I can do so only on the basis of second-hand reports, which naturally suffer from numerous distortions and limitations. We could no doubt collect many second-hand reports from various people and use statistics to identify recurring patterns. Such methods have enabled psychologists and brain scientists not only to gain a much better understanding of the mind, but also to improve and even save the lives of millions. However, it is hard to go beyond a certain point using only second-hand reports. In science, when you investigate a particular phenomena, it is best to observe it directly. Anthropologists, for example, make extensive use of secondary sources but if you really want to understand Simone culture sooner or later you will have to pack your bags and visit Samoa. Of course visiting isn't enough. A blog written by a backpacker traveling through Samoa would not be considered a scientific anthropological study because most backpackers lack the necessary tool and training. 
their observations are too random and biased. To become trustworthy anthropologists, we must learn how to observe human culture in a met- methodical and objective manner, free from preconceptions and prejudices. That's what you study at the Department of Anthropology and that's what enables anthropologists to play such a vital role in bridging gaps between different cultures. The scientific study of mind Sheldon follows this anthropological model, whereas anthropologists often report their visits to distinct islands, mysterious countries. Scholars of consciousness rarely undertake such personal journeys to the reliance of mind. For the only mind I can directly observe is my own, and no matter how difficult it is to observe Simone culture, Without bias and prejudice, it is even harder to observe my own mind objectively. After more than a century of hard work, anthropologists today have at their disposal powerful procedures for objective observation. In contrast, whereas mind scholars develop many tools for collecting and analyzing second-hand reports, when it comes to observing our own minds, we have barely scratched the surface. In the absence of modern methods for direct mind observation, we might try out some of the tools developed by pre-modern cultures. Several ancient cultures devoted a lot of attention to the study of mind, and they relied not on collecting second-hand reports, but on training people to observe their own mind systematically. The methods they developed are bunched together under the generic term meditation. Today, this term is often associated with religious and mysticism, but in principle meditation in any method for direct observation of one's own mind. Many religions indeed made extensive use of various meditation techniques, but this doesn't mean meditation is necessarily religious. Many religions have also made extensive use of books, yet that doesn't mean using books is a religious practice. Over the millennia, humans have developed hundreds of meditation techniques which differ in their principles and effectiveness. I have had personal experience with only one technique, Vipassana, so it is the only one about which I can talk with any authority. Like a number of other meditation techniques, Vipassana is said to have been discovered in ancient India by the Buddha. Over the centuries, numerous theories and stories have been ascribed to the Buddha, often without any supporting evidence. But you need not believe any of them in order to meditate. The teacher from whom I have learned Vipassana, Goenka, was a very practical kind of guide. He repeatedly instructed students that when they observe the mind, they must put aside all second-hand descriptions religious dogmas and philosophical conjectures and focus on their own experience and on whatever reality they actually encounter. Every day numerous students would come to his room to seek guidance and ask questions. At the entrance to the room a sign said please avoid theoretical and philosophical discussions and focus your question on matters related to your actual practice. The actual practice means to observe body sensations and mental reactions to sensations in a methodical, continuous and objective manner, thereby uncovering the basic patterns of the mind. People sometimes turn meditation into a pursuit of special experiences of bliss and ecstasy. Yet in truth, consciousness is the greatest mystery in the universe. and. Mundane feelings of hate and itching are every beat as much stress as feelings of rapture or cosmic oneness. Vipassana meditators are cautioned never to embark on a search for special experiences, but to concentrate on understanding the reality of the mind, whatever this reality might be. In recent years, scholars of both mind and brain have shown increasing interest in such meditation techniques. But most researchers have so far used this tool only indirectly. 
the typical scientist doesn't actually practice meditation herself rather she invites experienced meditators to her laboratory covers their heads with electrodes asks them to meditate and observes the resulting brain activities that can teach us many interesting things about the brain but if the aim is to understand the mind we are missing some of the most important insights it's like someone who tries to understand the structure of matter by observing a stone through a magnifying glass you come to this person hand him a microscope and say try this you could see much better he takes this microscope picks up his trusted magnifying glass and carefully observes through the magnifying glass the matter from which the microscope is made meditation is a tool for observing the mind directly you miss most of its potential if instead of meditating yourself you monitor electrical activities in the brain of some other meditator i am certainly not suggesting abandoning the present tools and practicing practices of brain research meditation doesn't replace them but it might complement them it's a bit like ingenious excavating a tunnel through a huge mountain why dig from any one side better dig simultaneously from both if the brain and the mind are indeed one and the same the two tunnels are bound to meet and if the brain and the mind aren't the same then it is all the more important to dig into the mind and not just into the brain some universities and laboratories have indeed begun using meditation as a research tool rather than as a mere object for brain studies yet this process is still in its infancy partially because it requires extraordinary investment on the part of the researchers Several meditation demands a tremendous amount of discipline. If you try to objectively observe your sensation, the first thing you will notice is how wild and impatient the mind is. Even if you focus on observing a re- relatively distinct sensation such as the breath coming in and out of your nostrils, your mind could usually do it for no more than a few seconds. But before it loses its focus and starts wandering in thoughts memories and dreams when a microscope goes out of focus we just need to turn a small handle if the handle is broken we can call a technician to repair it but when the mind loses focus we cannot repair it so easily it usually takes a lot of training to calm down and concentrate the mind so it can start observing itself methodologically and objectively perhaps in the future we could pop a pill and achieve instant focus yet since meditation aims to explore the mind rather than just focus it such a shortcut might prove counterproductive the pill may make us very alert and focused but at the same time it might also prevent us from exploring the entire spectrum of mind After all even today we can easily concentrate the mind by watching a good thriller on TV but the mind is so focused on movie that it cannot observe its own dynamics yet even if we cannot rely on such technological gadgets we shouldn't give up we can be inspired by the anthropologists zoologists and astronauts anthropologists and zoologists spent years on far away island exposed to a plethora of elements and dangers astronauts devote many years to difficult training regimes preparing for their hazardous excursions to outer space if we are willing to make such efforts in order to understand foreign culture unknown species and distinct planets it might be worth working just as hard in order to understand our own minds and we had better and